Testing, testing. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Sherwood Episcopal Church in Cockeysville. I also direct or say a hello to those who are on Facebook Live. We welcome you as well, as we are one body in Christ, worshiping together, even if it is remotely. Um, my name is uh, Mother Nancy Hennessy, and as we have our traditional announcements before we begin the service, uh, just to uh, draw your attention to our the message from our bishop co adjudicator elect Carrie Schofield Field Broadbent. She does want to be known as uh, Bishop Carrie, which is good because otherwise it's a long, long title. Um, but she is a marvelous, marvelous person. Um, I'm looking forward to working with her. She will be working alongside Bishop Sutton for several months, learning the ropes 
um, if you will, and then she will be consecrated, um, at, or she will be um, instituted as our bishop at the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. on September 14th. And that is open to all of us. I imagine I'll be there, but if any of you want to, to take part in that, it is something to be seen um, and something to experience. We'll have a huge choir, so anyone who wants to sing in the choir, um, we'll be having some information about that um, because it's a choir that will, be, will consist of all the parishes of those who want to be a part of that. Um, and it should be a spectacular day. So think about that um, in the fall, to go down to the National Cathedral. You can easily park in their parking deck below. There should be plenty of seats because it's so big, and it should be a wonderful, wonderful occasion. Also, I uh, encourage anyone who considers themselves new to Sherwood, whether they are new after a few years or whether they uh, are new just after a few weeks, uh, because we are having a membership or a new membership um, gathering. There will be three sessions. Um, one of our very own um, has agreed to host those at Broadmead in her home. And so we will determine the timing of that, but the day will be Wednesday, starting August 30th, and then it will also be on September 6th and September 13th. So think about um, being a part of that. We'll learn about each other. It'll give us a chance to get to know one another. Uh, we will also learn about the polity and the traditions and the um, sort of the history of the Episcopal Church. And then we will also talk about how you and we all can be a part of the body of Christ here at Sherwood and what opportunities um, can be afforded to you. So if you're interested, speak to me or speak to Carrie. Our emails are also in um, the bulletin and a phone number. Next Sunday, uh, even though um, Anne and uh, Ralph Wismer uh, are living in Florida, they have always been strong supporters and um, really a part of this community. She, Anne, often watches our worship on Sunday morning. So hello, Anne, if you are watching from Florida. But uh, they have donated new altar linens for the uh, frontal, altar frontal, and then for the pulpit, as well as for the lectern in white. And they have graciously dedicated that uh, to my ordination and my installation as your rector, which will be, it seems hard to believe, July 20th. And that'll be, I'll be starting my seventh year. So, or entering my eighth year, actually. So um, it should be a wonderful day. It'll be an opportunity for the Altar Guild to present these altar linens and that we as a parish will celebrate that with some blessings. Um, so I hope you will join us for that day um, because it is a wonderful gift to receive and it really maintains our church. We come every Sunday and we are in an environment and in a space that is well-maintained and well-loved. And that is not because of me, but it's because of you and those who came before you, who took the time to fix these windows, to redo things, to modernize, to put in a system that allows us to broadcast our service to people who live on the Eastern Shore and people who live in Florida and people who also live in central Pennsylvania. Those are some of the people that check in with us every Sunday. So um, we, need to, we need to celebrate that, and I hope you will join us next Sunday in doing so. There's some other announcements as well. Please look at those at your leisure, not during the sermon, however. And um, I will look forward to worshiping with you in a few moments. But until then, let us take a few moments to settle ourselves, to open our hearts to hearing God's word um, through the hymns that we will sing, the scripture that we will hear, and the prayers that we will offer up either silently or aloud. I'm so glad that you're all with us here today. Welcome.
Blessed be the one holy and living God. Glory to God. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. God be with you. Let us pray. O Lord, mercifully receive the prayers of your people who call upon you and grant that they may know and understand what things they ought to do and also may have grace and power faithfully to accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. Our first reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 55, verses 10 through 13. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led back in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall burst into song, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. And it shall be to the Lord for a memorial for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. The psalm appointed for today is Psalm 65, verses 1 through 14. We will read responsively by whole verse. You are to be praised, O God, in Zion. To you shall vows be performed in Jerusalem. Our sins are stronger than we are, but you will blot them out. Awesome things will show you us in your righteousness, O God of our salvation. 
O hope of all the ends of the earth and of the seas that are far away. You still the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, and the clamor of the peoples. You visit the earth and water it abundantly. You make it very plenteous. The river of God is full of water. You drench the furrows and smooth out the ridges. With heavy rain, you soften the ground and bless its increase. May the fields of the wilderness be rich for grazing, and the hills be clothed with joy. The second reading this morning is from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and to deal with sin, he condemns sin in the flesh so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, indeed it cannot, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, you are in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him 
that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the words of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what is sown on the path. As for what is sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. Thank you. Those who dwell at the ends of the earth will tremble at my marvelous signs. You make the dawn and the dusk to sing for joy. Amen. Please be seated. Last week our preacher was quite tall, so I'm readjusting everything. It was in the late 90s when an ad for Apple computers titled, Here's to the Crazy Ones. It images, there were images of people such as Albert Einstein, Bob Dylan, Martin Luther King, Thomas Edison, the Wright brothers, Amelia Earhart, Martha Graham, Gandhi, and Picasso. As their faces flashed on the screen, the narrator said, Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs and the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or even vilify them, about the only thing you can't do is ignore them because they change things. They push the human race forward. While some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. So I ask you, would you consider yourself to be listed among this, the crazy ones? The ones who see things differently, the ones who tend to stand out and not blend into the background, the ones often tossed aside as not worthy because they speak the truth 
when it is hard to hear? Or are you one who melds into the masses, living below the radar screen, afraid to challenge what you know is wrong for fear how others may respond? Now, I'm not going to ask you to answer that question, but as we read today's gospel reading about the sower and the seed, I suspect that Jesus would be one who would make this illustrious get list. He certainly saw things differently. He pushed against the status quo, and he challenged those in authority. And let's not overlook God. After all, it is God who, portrayed as the sower, randomly tosses seeds extravagantly, sharing his love with all creation. Everyone, everyone and everything, including you. Now, for us to fully understand this parable, we must re recognize the context in which it was written. We must look to chapter 12 of Matthew. That is the chapter that is between chapter 11 that we read last week and chapter 13 that we read this week. In chapter 12, the Pharisees, or the leaders, begin to openly challenge Jesus, questioning his actions and accusing him of breaking the Sabbath because he and his disciples pull grain from the fields to eat. And the Pharisees are shocked that he heals the blind and the maim again on the Sabbath, breaking one of the many laws of their faith. No longer are his challengers hiding in the shadows, whispering about him behind their back, his back. They have become vocal and visible. And this is where today's scripture enters the story. Jesus begins to explain God's vision for the world through the parables he shares. The first parable known as the sower of the seed, one that we heard just a few minutes ago. Now, I wonder if you notice that it was shared with two different audiences, thus providing two different interpretations of the same parable. The first explanation of the sower of the seed is Matthew 13, 1 through 9, and it is told to the people who have crowded around him so much so that he gets in a boat and so they can hear him from the shoreline. And the second explanation is Matthew 13, 18 through 23, where Jesus is speaking privately to the apostles who first take him aside and ask him why he teaches in parables. Now, his first rendering of the sower of the seed focuses on God's abundant and extravagant love, shown as he randomly tosses seeds of love everywhere and anywhere. Whereas when Jesus speaks to his inner circle, the focus shifts to the importance of the fertile soil, or I would say, your soul, your heart. There is no mention of the sower randomly tossing his seeds. His second message is directly related to really those who were experiencing the burgeoning of, of Christianity and living within all of that turmoil, where literally their lives were at stake. They needed to be fed with the knowledge that they had to have a strong faith, a strong soil, a strong heart, to endure all that they had to endure. He instructs that rich soil or a rich and open heart must be focused on God and only God, who rewards everyone with a bountiful crop. crop. And when they turn from Jesus and his teaching, turning from God's love, the seeds can't be nourished or to grow. Thus today, we have two different focuses on the same parable, and each of those focuses pertain to us. 
it is often enticing to focus on our own soil and wonder how well we are preparing our soil or our soul to receive God's abundance. Quite honestly, the summer is a perfect time because it is a change of rhythm so we can reset ourselves and begin to nourish our souls to better receive God's word and love, to find perhaps a new rhythm for our prayer life, jumping off that never-ending treadmill of busyness that steers us away from God and actually stop and rest and refocus on to our creator and his wonderful works giving our soil a bit of miracle grow, if you will, so our heart is first and foremost focused on God and the abundance of his love that flows from him. But so focusing solely on our own soil content or our health status of our own soul, we ignore Jesus' other interpretation of this parable, the tossing of God's seeds of love. Being a follower of Jesus is not done alone, where we rely only on our own determination, our own theology, our own grit to live into God's dream. No, self-reliance is a fallacy, and when it comes to being a person of faith, it is often the love of and care of others that lift us out of our own darkness. It is the dedication and selfless love of others that inspire us to be better. We would not be fertile ground if we didn't have one another. When this parable is told to those standing on the shoreline, Jesus explains how God randomly tosses seeds out without much thought just throwing seeds here and there, knowing that they will land on rock or depleted soil or cracks and crevices and even lush, fertile soil. And with each toss, Jesus doesn't carry the worry of whether the seeds will grow or wither. He doesn't place his bets on soil that will yield a better crop, ignoring depleted soil. He merely tosses seeds about to anyone and everyone without discriminating against one type of soil over the other. Jesus knows where it lands. It may either die or it will flourish, and that is up to the ground that receives it. In other words, God focuses on all loving creatures, great and small, faithful and unfaithful, sinless and sinful, God wants all the seeds that he tosses to yield bountiful crops, yet he also gives the soil that receives his loving seeds the freedom to provide nourishment for the seed to promote growth or to ignore it altogether. I would say that that is not the best business plan, but that isn't that the point. Our faith isn't a business plan. It isn't even a human plan. Our faith reflects God's plan of sharing his love with abandon. I wonder what it would look like if we simply would share our love everywhere, provide love and care to anyone in need, or maybe not in any need, spreading love as if we are tossing seeds randomly, not concerned where they land and what yield we will get from our tossing or how many seats will be filled in our church because of our hard and dedicated work, but simply tossing love, not worrying where it lands, but knowing that our love will land gently. I would say it sounds rather idealistic, but God's dream for all creation isn't within the realm of human practicality. That would be much too limiting. No, we should, and I say dare, that we must throw our seeds of God's love everywhere. Where they land, how people will respond, what our seeds will yield cannot be the driving force behind our seed tossing. We must simply toss Toss love freely, 
with no expectations. Jesus wasn't a believer of the zero-sum game, where if one person or group of people receive a benefit, it will ne negatively impact another group. No, that is the deadly belief of individuals, communities, and even nations who promote this belief to keep some at a disadvantage. It has been done since the beginning of time, and it is still being done today. Despite what some may want us to believe, wherever God's love is spread, whomever receives it, a sinner or a not a sinner, these gain, those gains are all for our benefit as well. One's gift of God's loving seed is our gift as well. The Clean Water Project is an example of how today's parable encourages us to toss seeds of love. We never would have embarked on this large, audacious project if we were only focused on the cost and the magnitude of a project for a small congregation, concerns that would be considered by a reasonable business person. But as people of faith, we must also rely on the Holy Spirit to guide us, not just the business matrix behind the project. Should we be reckless? Oh, no. But by stepping out in faith, we are spreading God's love by preserving God's creation from the destruction of erosion and polluting waters. This project isn't solely our own. It is the community's and God's as well. I know deep in my heart that we are moving in the wrong direction, not at our pace, I might add, but God's pace, allowing God to be our leader, not the other way around. We could leave our erosion problem alone, leaving it for a future generation to deal with. That is often the norm. It has been done for generations. But I challenge all of us as individuals and as a community of faith to heed the two lessons from today's parable, the lesson of tending our own soil so that we can receive God's love and become stronger, more faithful, more like Jesus, and also spread our love without worry or hesitation so God's world can finally become a reality or at least begin to become a reality. Yes, we, could, we should add our names and this community of faith to the list of the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. Maybe then, just maybe, this world will reflect more love than hate, more hope than despair, more faith than fear, giving the space for seeds of love to take root and change the world. Yes, my friends, here's to the crazy ones. Amen. And now let us all stand and recite the Nicene Creed as found on the top of page seven of your bullet. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, the Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from God. True God, from true God, God not made, one being with the Father. Through him all things are made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and Virgin Mary, and truly became. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again. In accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. 
He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son worship the glory of God. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Prayers of the people. Come to prayer, all who labor and are heavy laden, and God will give us rest. Come to praise, saying, Lord, hear our prayer. We thank you for the revelation of your gift of abundant life and for the rest coming to those who put their trust in you. For such life and rest, Lord, hear our prayer. We thank you for entrusting us with the message of grace that we might speak a reconciling word to your age. For such mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. We thank you for leading us into the ways of peace and for transforming weapons of war into tools of charity. For such peacemaking, Lord, hear our prayer. We thank you for the people of faith who surround us and for the family and friends teachers, and clergy who assist our growth in grace. Guide the hearts and minds of those who will choose our next president, presiding bishop, bishop, that we may receive a faithful pastor who will care for all of your people, equip us for our ministries, and proclaim your word to us and to the world. For such companions through life, Lord, hear our prayer. We thank you for the gifts of creation and for wholesome times of recreation, for such times of harmony. Lord, hear our prayer. We thank you for the blessings of this life, especially for those celebrated birthdays, including Janet Barr and Joyce Mann, as well as anniversaries. For such joyous occasions, Lord, hear our prayer. We thank you for those who tend to the sick, accompany the frustrated, visit the lonely, comfort the dying, confront the addicted, or minister to any need. We pray for the departed, Lloyd Gilmore, neighbor of Larry and Susan Boucher, as well as his friends and family. We pray for those on our parish prayer list, Joe C., Chip, Raymond, Peggy, Sally E., Liz M., Kevin M., Lisa P., Victor, Joyce T., Kim, Bernie C., Tony, Midge, Barbara, Joan L., Rachel, Doreen, Norma, Virginia, Don, Isla, Tommy C., Alec and Linda, for such attention to human anguish, Lord, hear our prayer. We thank you for sustaining all those who are oppressed, all who suffer for reasons of conscience, all who are passionate for justice, for such signs of the coming kingdom. Into your hands, O God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now let us confess our sins to God. God of all mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you, opposing your will in our lives. We have denied your goodness in each other, in ourselves and in the world you have created. We repent of the evil that enslaved us, the evil we have done, 
and that uh, you put on our behalf. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us through our Savior, Jesus Christ, that we may abide in your love and serve your Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of Christ be always with you. Let us greet one another in peace. And let us not forget our friends on Facebook Live. <laughs> peace be with you. <laughs> getting back to spreading the peace. It's been a long time. Just a simple reminder that we are all welcome to the table. If you would like to um, receive the bread and wine, you certainly may. If you choose not to, but still want to come and have a blessing, you may, and just put your hands over your chest, and I will be honored to give you a blessing for that day, for this day. And now let us walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God.
Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and good and joyful to give you thanks, all holy God, source of light, life, and fountain of mercy. You have filled us and all creation with your blessing and fed us with your constant love. You have redeemed us in Jesus Christ and knit us into one body. Through your spirit, you replenish us and call us to fullness of life. Therefore, joining with angels and archangels and with the faithful of every generation, we lift our voices with all creation as we sing. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of the universe and giver of life. You formed us in your own image and called us to dwell in your infinite love. You gave the world into our care that we might be your faithful stewards and show forth your bountiful grace. But we failed to honor your image in one another and in ourselves. We would not see your goodness in the world around us and so we violated your creation, abused one another, and rejected your love. Yet you never ceased to care for us and prepared the way of salvation for all people. Through Abraham and Sarah, you called us into covenant with you. You delivered us from slavery, sustained us in the wilderness, raised up prophets to renew your promise of salvation. Then, in the fullness of time, you sent your eternal word, through, made mortal flesh in Jesus, born into a human family and dwelling among us. He revealed your glory. Giving him freely to death on the cross, he triumphed over evil, opening the way of freedom and life. On the night before he died for us, our Savior Jesus Christ took bread and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it. And he gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat, do this for the remembrance of me. After supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we pro proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Remembering his death and resurrection, we now present to you from your creation this bread and this wine. By your Holy Spirit, may they be for us the body and blood of your Savior, Jesus Christ. Grant that we who share these gifts may be filled with the Holy Spirit and live as God, Christ's body in the world. Bring us into everlasting heritage of your daughters and sons that with all your saints, past, present, and yet to come, we may praise your name forever. Through Christ and with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to be honor and glory and praise forever and ever. Amen. And as our Savior has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. 
For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
the post-communion prayer. God of abundance, you have fed us with the bread of life and cup of salvation. You have united us with Christ and one another, and you have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Live without fear. Your creator has made you holy, has always protected you, and loves you as a mother. Go in peace and follow the good road, and may God's blessing be with you always. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We go into the world refreshed and renewed. Let us reaffirm our commitment to our mission as a congregation, saying together, God commands us to enthusiastically cast open our doors to embrace all, impacting lives through bold service. No exceptions. <laughs> Let us go forth to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks, God. <laughs>